Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. I've got Andy Abraham here with me. We've got a special episode going on here, a little Freestyle Friday. He's with Scheid Family Wines. I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit more, kind of tell us who he is, how he got here, and then we're going to get into some really killer wines. So go ahead, Andy. <laughs> All righty. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Andy Abraham. Uh, I work for Scheid Family Wines. I'm based out in Monterey, California, which is where our winery is located. We have, um, well, I guess first I'll, I'll, you know, dive in about myself before I get too much into the, into the winery. But um, I've been in the wine industry about 12 years now. Okay. Um, got started just on a whim. Uh, found an opportunity to work in a tasting room and jumped on it just part time, a couple days a week, and. That was really my introduction to wine. I come from an Italian background family. We'd have wine, you know. Mix oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. We didn't come up during lunch. I know, I know. I, I should have. about my Italian side. <laughs> yeah, okay, I get it. All right. So. We started off when we were young. We'd, you know, a little bit of red wine, a little bit of water. Yeah, yeah. Because we didn't want to get the kids too drunk. But Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, you know, took this opportunity to, to, to learn about wine by working in a tasting room. And that was actually at Talbot Vineyards mm -hmm. um, in Carmel Valley, California. Um, and then moved into a marketing capacity for them, um, worked as a marketing coordinator, um, got to do a full harvest in the vineyard and out in the, in the winery, dragging hose and shoveling out tanks and the whole bit. Um, so I got to see that side of it, which was, again, great for my knowledge and, and learning. Um, and then moved on and ended up working for Gallo Winery for a while um, and moved to Modesto, worked at the, the headquarters there, helped to support the Napa and Sonoma based brands in their mm -hmm. portfolio, um, especially the brands with the uh, taste room components. So like William Hill, Jay Vineyards and Winery, Louis Martini. Um, but I was kind of ready to move back home to the Monterey Peninsula and, you know, looked around and found a, a position open at Scheid Family Wines, which I was really familiar with because growing up in the area and working in the wine industry there. So just jumped on the opportunity to move back to Monterey and um, been at Scheid Family Wines now for about two, three and a half years. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, we kind of talked about our histories. Um, you know, we're going to I don't ever stop. We're going to move this over because we want to get this into the shot here. First of all, we have a, we have a really cool glass here and we have a couple of wines. We're not going to talk. We're not going to um, uh, taste, but we're going to we're going to talk about them a little bit. But I just want them in the shot. Anyway, um, so I never I never stop for anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Andy, um, so that's really cool. So, yeah. Uh, so you're, you kind of went back home in a way, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so. We're here at Frederick's Bistro. Um, there's a couple of Fredericks. Um, we're down. We're at the downtown. Well, not quite downtown. We're we're near closer to downtown. Uh, we're actually literally next door to the best pizza in town, Florio's Pizza. I gotta give them a shout out too. But we just had some lunch, um, and I had some pho. Um, pho, if you're not really sure how to pronounce it, but apparently it's pho. Um, we both had the pho. Do you like it? I, it was I fantastic. It. Uh, it was great. Um, we had some other appetizers with it. Got to taste some of the wines ahead of time, which is always a bonus for me to taste some wines ahead of time so I, I know what's going on. Um, so they really went well with a lot of the stuff we had. And if you've ever in town in San Antonio, you need to check out Frederick's. Uh, besides the pho, which is apparently, according to who, whoever you're talking to, is the best in town. And I've never had other than, Fr I've had, I think, pho one other place. And this is better. Um, they got some really cool, it's like an Asian French fusion thing going on. Um, it has to do with Frederick's background. Um, so you should check it out. Give them, give them a shout out for hosting us for, for lunch. Um, so yeah. And so we've got some really cool stuff here. Shide wine. Um, they've been around for how long now? 50 years. 50 years, right? So 50 years ago. Um, kind of tell me about the history of them. How did they get started? And, and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Uh, so Al Scheid, he's mm -hmm. 90 years old um, right now. He's the, uh, the founder of the company. Um, came from a financial background, um, investment banking, and uh, then transitioned into vineyards and winery. And um, this was back in the day when you could offset profits um, for you know, tax purposes um, with expenses. And so, you know, 
plant in a vineyard, you're not going to make any money for, for some time because it takes a while for the grapes yes. to grow and all of that. So um, that's kind of how he got started. It was more of a financial background, um, but really, I mean, fell into in, into love with farming and growing grapes and um, enlisted all the best resources and helped to, to make sure he was making the right decisions when making the planting decisions and finding the location. And so we worked with um, some partners up at uh, UC Davis to identify Monterey as a fantastic location for growing grapes. Because back in the early 70s, there was very few grapes grown in Monterey. We were one of the first planters of, of the Monterey area. Um, and so, you know, started with the first probably, gosh, uh, 20, 30 years, um, just growing grapes and selling them to other wineries. And then, um, you know, eventually these other wineries that we were selling all the fruit to said, you know, they started saying, well, could you actually produce some wine for us? Um, because their capacity was exceeded at their facilities. So they still loved the fruit quality that they were receiving from us, but they needed a little bit of help producing it. So at that time, um, Al decided, sure, let's go into this other segment of the business that we hadn't previously tapped into yet. And so we started making um, contract wine, essentially. Uh, and then it was in probably about 2010, we took the next evolution in, in our company history, which was to develop our own branded goods um, and sell our own wines under our own labels. So today we have roughly 80 brands that we produce um, in the Scheid Family Wines portfolio. Okay. Lots of them are private labels. Um, some of them are regionally exclusive. And then we have our, our global brands, which we um, produce under the Scheid Family Wines, um, you, you know, company, I guess. Umbrella? Umbrella. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for the word. That, that helps. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a, a selection of those on we the do, table yeah. today. So we've got Scheid Vineyards, the namesake label. Um, and that's the, the label that's been around the longest. I believe our first vintage of Scheid Vineyards was 1989. Um, we've got Metz Road, uh, a single vineyard Chardonnay and Pinot Noir brand. Um, VDR, very dark red is the acronym for that wine. Um, uh, big and bold over the top uh, red wine. And then we've got other wines like Stokes Ghost, which is a petite Syrah, and Sunny with a Chance of Flowers, which yeah, is... Yeah, let's, let's grab these because it's kind of hard to see them right now. All right. Um, so we got Stokes Ghost. We talked about, hey, we should do this for Halloween, but this episode came out well after Halloween. <laughs> um, and I just finished recording mine. And then we have with the Sunny with a... I like the name, Sunny with a Chance of Flowers. Um, so we can talk about these a little bit, but I just want to get them a little front yeah. and center so people can see them. Um, so yeah, I mean, starting off as a, um, as basically growers for a lot of people, this is normal for a lot of, I mean, from what I understand of, especially California history, you have a lot of people who are growers first and they were growers for many decades. And then at some point in time, they said, we're going to make some wine, um, having, being asked to do make uh, contract wine. I've talked about this somewhat recently with some of my other episodes that this is totally cool. Like this is absolutely the way things work just because I don't own the winery, but I have someone make the wine for me. Um, and depending on how much involved I'm going to be with this, you know, custom crush, or whatever you want to call it, um, is absolutely acceptable. And there's some amazing wines that are made this way. Um, so yeah, I just, I just want people to realize that when you say, well, we make a lot of wines for people, there's nothing wrong with that. This is not like you, you, you've shipped, you, it's not like you said, oh, this is the grapes that, that are horrible. We're going to make wine for you. I mean, this yeah. is like legit high quality stuff. And this is, this is what happens. Um, yeah, that's really cool. So I was looking at the website and um, we were talking about farming. And before we, we were talking about farming, I understand you have a lot of sustainability initiatives and organic stuff. You want to talk, touch about on that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, we're currently farming just a little over 3,000 acres. Um, we have s implemented sustainability practices throughout the entire operation from um, the vineyard side of things through the winery. Um, I think the most notable thing or one of the most notable things is our entire winery campus is powered by a single 400 foot tall wind turbine. That's cool. It's super <laughs> cool. Um, and that, I mean, those suckers, they generate a ton of energy. So we actually generate a surplus of energy that we don't um, require on our campus. And that gets fed back into the grid and powers roughly 125 homes in, in the local community. Yeah, um, They're really impressive, uh, the, the energy that can be created by those wind turbines. I, I bet. Yeah. I mean, you know, sustainability, sustainable energy. I mean, I think it's definitely way of the future. Um, 
you know, as much as we can do with it as possible. I know maybe some certain parts of the world maybe not as conducive to it as others. But yeah, I think it's a great initiative that you guys have been doing for a while. Um, you also are, is it CCOF? Correct, yeah. CCOF. So that's, uh, what was it, the certif Certi California Certified Organic Farming? Or something farmers. Like that? Farmers, I farmers, so. yeah. Um, so organic farming is going on. Uh, have you guys been doing that for quite a while as far as that type of farming? We, so we have currently certified organic, 86 acres, yeah. um, which is our white flower vineyard, uh, which is probably, I think it's our furthest south vineyard, just mm -hmm. about to the Paso Robles border. Um, we are currently in the process of transitioning over um, other vineyard acreages to certified, but they aren't certified status yet. Right, Because yeah. there's that three-year transitional period um, that you have to be farming uh, consistently with certified organic practices before you can actually be certified. Right, yeah, yeah. We had a little bit of a head start on the white flower vineyard because that one from the beginning was uh, was planted with the intent to be certified organic. So it wasn't like we had to go through the, the, the turnover process. You pretty much were there at the time. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and I mean, this stuff takes a while. Um, besides the fact that it can be very costly, um, it also takes a while. And I mean, it's very, it's very important. It's a very important um, uh, thing to go through that you're making that commitment because the minute you do something that's not organic, you lose that certification for three years at least, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, it's a very important thing to have that certified organic stuff. Um, very so yeah. important. But I would add to, uh, I think certified organic is, and just the organic in general um, has got this huge catchphrase kind of yes. buzz to it. Um, but there's a lot of other kind of green practices, sustainability practices that go much in line with sort of the organic philosophy or mindset of just yes. basically being better for the environment and better for the community, better for the employees. And we've been doing that since the very beginning. Um, and that's something that's been at the core to what Al Scheid, uh, our founder, um, really believes in from the start. So all of our vineyards uh, are certified sustainable. Um, we use really great technology in the vineyard that would be preci precision agriculture, essentially, to target and only water when absolutely necessary and at the right amount necessary. So throughout our vineyards, we've got soil probes that measure the water um, consistency at different depths. And we can really you know, turn on a little bit of water here, a little bit of water there. It's not just this blanket, let's flood the vineyards with water. Um, it's very targeted, very precise. Um, in, in the practices. And then when, when you look at the, the winery end of it, um, yes, the wind turbine, that's the, the most noticeable thing. Um, but just the way the winery is built, it's, it's state of the art. Um, the use of lo lots of natural light. We have skylights throughout the winery and it makes the environment just that much more pleasing for everyone that has to work there. Um, it, it's easier uh, on the eyes, easier on the body, you're less fatigued at the end of the day. Um, so it's really this all encompassing mindset uh, of sustainability, um, and I would I would include organic as a component of this larger mindset. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean sustainability to me, and 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 those of you who've been watching my stuff for a while, you know I did something about sustainability, and I think that's a really important thing. It's not just the organic side; it really is how you operate as a business. Um, just what you do in the winery, outside the winery, with your community, with your employees, that kind of stuff. So it's not just getting organic grapes. That's one thing. It's how you, what you do after that uh, is very important. So sustainability to me is, is a great doing it right type of, uh, type of way of doing things. Um, you were talking about something. Oh, so, and then irrigation real quick. Irrigation is not a bad thing. Like you guys are being targeted irrigation. That's the way it should be done. Um, you're not in the central Valley doing quote bulk $300 per ton stuff. Um, you're doing high quality stuff. So when you hear about irrigated wines or vines, it's not a negative. It can be, but it's not a negative in your case. You guys are doing it the right way. You're only doing it when necessary. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people understood that irrigation is not a bad thing. It can be just like anything else. Certain power can be can be bad or good. And you guys are doing it on, on the good side of things. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so We've got a few wines here, and I know we tasted we tasted all three of these. And we first did. of all, I'll just say they all tasted really good. Um, but um, let's let's kind of start with I guess the Sauvignon Blanc, and we can kind of talk about uh, what's what's behind all that real quick. Absolutely. So um, the namesake label of the family, so the Shide uh, Shide Vineyards, is 
our, um, the, the label that we got started with. Uh, and it's really, for us, it's, it's a small kind of boutique brand, boutique wine within the larger Scheid family wines um, portfolio. And so that, I guess, would be the first distinction I would try to make is Scheid Vineyards is the brand, Scheid Family Wines is the company. Okay. Um, but Scheid Vineyards as a brand is primarily direct to consumer. We have two tasting rooms. We have a tasting room uh, at the Estate Winery in Greenfield, California. And then we have a tasting room in downtown Carmel-by-the-Sea. Uh, we have roughly about 3,000 wine club members in our club currently, sell on the website. Um, but it doesn't, get, it doesn't get out into the broad market in a big way. Right, um, yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, it's got the family name on it. They're, they want to protect that. There's a lot of sensitivity around it to make sure that, that we keep this, you know, very sacred um, and, and rightfully so. So what we do with this uh, Sauvignon Blanc is we let the fruit really express itself. Um, we don't add any oak, no oak aging or influence. It's all stainless steel, um, creating a crisp, clean, refreshing style Sauvignon Blanc that's really representative of the Monterey area. We're not trying to be someplace that we, we aren't. We're not trying to be a New Zealand style Sauvignon Blanc. We're not trying to be a Napa style Sauvignon Blanc. We're trying to be Monterey. And with our vineyard holdings that we have, um, they span 70 miles from north to south in Monterey County. The furthest north is closest to Monterey Bay. Very cool climate. Um, so on the Winkler scale, uh, uh, temperature scale, that's a region one. Mm -hmm. um, of the five regions, Monterey has four of the five regions. So with our Sauvignon Blanc being planted on multiple vineyards, we get the cool climate, we get some of the, the more milder region two, region three climates that go into our Sauvignon Blanc, but it just creates this very nicely balanced overall uh, rounded, well, well rounded yeah. um, Sauvignon Blanc. Cool. Um, I should have already put up the Winkler scale, but in case I didn't, I know I did. Uh, so the Winkler scale is just something that we, especially in the industry, are able to kind of get an idea how cool or hot a climate is, is based upon average sunlight hours. Um, but yeah, I probably put the chart up from Wikipedia, I'm sure. Um, but it's a really great way to kind of understand things as far as what is cool climate, moderate, or, or a warm climate uh, environment. Um, so during lunch, we kind of talked about... Um, uh, Monterey Bay itself. So somebody mentioned that it was an, a, an under an underwater Grand Canyon. Absolutely. All right. I, 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 maybe Google Earth can help me out with that part. I don't know. We'll, 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 I think we'll it see. does show it on Google Earth. Yeah, I've, I've looked at it. Yeah, you can definitely see it. I think I can do without the water type of thing. I think I can do just. I think I can do just the ocean floor. So I'm gonna try. If it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do that. It's very cool. So the we call it the. I mean, we don't. It's not something that's you know sacred to shy family <laughs> wines it's called the underwater grand canyon um in monterey bay it's about two miles deep um i believe it's 60 miles wide mm. um but very cold deep water that creates a lot of upwelling very nutrient rich so the sea life in monterey bay is amazing um we've got, had a bunch of whales out there recently a um, bunch of sea lions most sea lions i've ever seen in my life there was this big migration of sea lions but all of that upwelling that is creating a really nutrient rich environment for the sea life also creates this giant fog bank that rolls in off of the Monterey Bay, coats the, the Salinas Valley in cool fog, cooling it down in the evenings. Um, and then in the, in the, you know, early mornings, you still have the fog lingering in late morning, early afternoon, it all kind of floats back out and burns off. We get nice warm growing uh, temperatures throughout the day. And that, large diurnal shift from daytime temperatures to nighttime temperatures really creates a perfectly conducive environment for growing wine grapes um, because the vines get to put out and expend a ton of energy during the day to ripen these these grapes but then uh, they get a little re relaxation and reprieve in the evening um, to recover so they can start the next day absolutely i mean um we talked about we talked about like Monterey in general. We got to the Monterey wines, which this is one of them. We also got to the Metz Road stuff. Um, I talked about how when it comes to California wines, certain wines, not all California wines, it kind of depends on the wine. Um, but when we get to like cooler climates like Monterey, like Anderson Valley, like Fort Ross Seaview, that's actually really the true cool climate of Sonoma Coast. Um, when you get the Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs from those, from those wines, from those, from those areas, and even Sauvignon Blanc, um, I really prefer 
those wines as far as California style. There's still the ripeness of fruit, um, but you still have that cooler climate, not over the top ripeness and all that. So I think um, I think this Sauvignon Blanc is excellent. Like you said, it does, it's not meant to be a New Zealand. It's not meant to be Napa. It's not even a Sancerre. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't meet those others because it shouldn't. It should be its own thing. And I really believe that wines, wine should speak to their terroir um, and not try to necessarily imitate somebody else. I know like in places like Texas, we don't really have a, well, we have a style, but we have a lot of people that are trying to emulate um, other regions. But at the end of the day, you need to, you need to have your own style um, it's okay to be a cover band, but you want really the, the goal of any band is to be their own band and do their own material. Absolutely. So I, I use music references a lot. Um, we didn't talk about this, but actually my background is music. Um, I have a degree in music, okay. okay. but I was in restaurants forever. So I, I, I wanted to eat. I didn't want to be a starving musician <laughs> in college. Um, so I never was in a band. I just, I just got my degree, but, um, no, I mean, I think it's great. We talked about how like all the different, uh, parts of Monterey and what they bring to the Sauvignon Blanc. So you have that cool climate stuff. You also have that little ripeness of fruit for when you get into the to the more southern part of Monterey. Um, yeah, and the Sauvignon Blanc, we're not growing all the way to the, the further yeah, southern always, reaches yeah, of, yeah. of Monterey. Um, it's kind of more in the, I guess, that middle mm-hmm. middle range. Um, but those w- little bit warmer characteristics bring out more melon, guava, yes. tropical notes. The cooler climates, you know, that's where you get a little bit more of the acidity. That's where you get maybe a little bit more of that grassy style that would be similar to New Zealand, right? But not New Zealand. Um, so it's that blending of all of them that we can we have the ability to do with the multiple vineyards that we're growing Sauvignon Blanc um, that really creates this very well-rounded wine. I think it's delicious. Like, um, you know, this is one that, you know, again, you won't necessarily find it everywhere. You might find it at, on a restaurant list. You might find it in a smaller type of wine shop or a specialty type of wine thing. You're not going to find it like at Kroger necessarily. Um, Kroger's been making a big, lots of waves in San Antonio. Plus they apparently are going to buy Albertsons or something like that. I don't know. Um, or something they're going to buy like, I don't know. So, but in, the, in your specialty shops, something like that, you might find it. If you do, I think you should get it. Um, uh, did you know uh, off the top of your head? I think we discussed retail on this, did we? Uh, yes. Yeah, so in our tasting room, tasting rooms are always a little bit more expensive yeah. than you would find it in the broad market. Um, so in our tasting room, it retails for twenty five dollars. Yeah. Um, but you, if if you do find this out in the market, uh, it's usually right about nineteen ninety nine twenty dollars. Okay. Um, usually uh, on a buy the glass menu. If you find it at a restaurant, which as far as our distribution goes, it's mostly going to be on-premise restaurants. Yes. Um, it's usually in that $12 by the glass range. Okay. Yeah. So here's one thing, um, not to necessarily to reference other episodes of mine, but retail markup is not a thing. Like in this case, retailers are probably selling, are selling it for less than what the winery sells it for. Um, not you're not retailers don't want to sell it for like if, if you're in a retailer situation, you're not going to sell it for $30. I mean, not that you couldn't get $30 for it, but you're not going to sell for 30 bucks or 35 because the winery is going to sell it for 25 and somebody's going to come and say, well, I can go to the winery and get it for 25 Like, yeah, you can. Um, restaurants are a little different. The markup's different there. But yeah, I mean, I think this is excellent. I really enjoyed this uh, to start off our lunch. Um, we had the, I, I think we had already moved on to the to a different wine when we did the Brussels sprouts, but I think this would have been great. Those, those Brussels sprouts. Oh, they were really good. They were good. Like, I'm, I'm always on the fence with Brussels sprouts. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. And I've had them here before. So when we ordered them, I was like, yeah. And I forgot. I had been, it's been like three some odd years since I've been here. Um, so, yeah, those Brussels sprouts were excellent, the sauce to use. So this was great with that. The Chardonnay, we have the Pinot, right? We do have so the Pinot. So the Chardonnay, um, I'll, I'll just briefly touch about the Chardonnay from Metz Road. Um, it was really good. Um, I, I've joked with them at the table that Chardonnay is not my reach, not my first choice for white wine. Sauvignon Blanc is more likely what I would reach for for a white wine or Viognier or some other white wine. Um, but I will say that that Chardonnay was really nice. Again, a cooler climate type of thing, kind of kind of Burgundian style. I know that we kind of talked about that. That's the kind of goal, have a closer to Burgundy versus your, I guess, over the top super ripe Chardonnay that California is known for. Um, so I have to say that that one was really nice. Um, but yeah, this, the Sauvignon Blanc is excellent. Um, well, yeah, you. let's, let's move on to, to the, uh, the next one. Yeah. The Pinot. So 
now we're moving from the Shide brand to the Metz Road brand, um, which is a super fun brand for us. Um, we're doing some really interesting things uh, in the winery um, and in the vineyard with this with this brand. But most notice notably would be um, the production process. So our winemaker, uh, whose name is on the back label, Casey De Cesare. Um, I hope I pronounced that right, Casey. Um, De Sounds really good. I think Sounds it's like it's probably, probably in Italy, De Cesare. It's De Cesare. Good Italian but, girl. <laughs> um, or, or maybe, uh, is he married? He, he is married. Oh, he, oh sorry. He's, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, for some reason, oh, because Casey, Casey could be both. It could, it could go both he, ways. So then, yeah, yeah he, he's probably a good Italian guy. I'm sorry. Casey, I apologize, dude. I'm so <laughs> sorry. But I know a lot of female Casey's and male Casey's. I just went with the... Anyway, never mind. Let's go back to the wine. Anyway, um, let's talk about the wine because I really like this wine too. Yeah, so what Casey's doing um, is, is pretty unique. We actually have a shipping container, two shipping containers technically, that were dropped right in the smack center of our vineyard, the Riverview Vineyard, um, to allow us to do in-vineyard native yeast fermentations. So that's pretty unique, that's pretty special. We pick the grapes, um, usually very early morning when Casey gets out to the shipping container, the winery, it's a bonded winery, um, but- That's cool, actually. It's <laughs> super cool, it's super cool. Uh, so the grapes are there waiting for him, he can you know, start pressing the Chardonnay right away um, in the early mornings when the temperatures are still cool, get it sent off to barrel for fermentation, um, for the Pinot Noir, and we're you know, in, in, the, in the shipping container doing a, you know, punch downs, um, all, of, all of it's happening right there. What that does though is this idea that you hear about so often in the wine world of this sense of place and mm -hmm. terroir. And, and I think oftentimes it can get a little bit overused um, and it feels sometimes less unique because every winery almost is making a very similar claim of we're showing the sense of place of whatever vineyard that they're growing their grapes on. For us, I think what we were able to do is stay so true to that that we actually took it to the next step um, for this what I'll call ultimate sense of place or ultimate uh, expression of terroir. And that is to really let the natural microflora that's floating around in the vineyard conduct the fermentation. So we're not inoculating, we're not adding any commercial yeast strains to, to get things going. We're just letting, we're pressing or we're, we're putting the, the Pinot in, into the tank and we're just letting the natural microflora start the fermentation and, and continue the fermentation. What's, what we've noticed is um, it's from the start of fermentation through the end of fermentation, various yeast strains will kind of jump in and out. Yes. Um, so you might have one that starts the fermentation, then it eventually will get overpowered by the next and that will continue the fermentation and so on. We send samples throughout the, the harvest process um, out to labs to get essentially DNA fingerprinted for, for what yeast strains are actually conducting the fermentation. What that allows us to do is make sure um, that a commercial yeast strain somehow didn't get in there to, to do the fermentation. What it also allows us to do is track the different yeast strains. And it's not uncommon for us to see 15 to 20 different yeast strains conducting the fermentation on any given vintage for either the Chardonnay or the Pinot Noir. And that just adds a bunch of complexity to it, um, to the wine. It's, it's very interesting, um, very, you know, layered, and, and uh, I think it just comes out in, in the wine. So pretty unique process that we're doing and what, that Casey's doing out mm -hmm. in the winery. So once he's finished with the fermentation side, uh, what type of oak treatment are you doing with this? So this one does see, it's 100% it's French oak. Um, mm -hmm. We don't leave it in the trailer um, for the oak aging yeah. process. Once it's fermented, once the wine is- You don't want to make whiskey? Be, no. <laughs> <laughs> Put it like in the middle of the summer, make sure it's in the right spot in the, in the, in the house, yeah. I, I'm sure, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's temperature controlled in there. It, but, is, yeah. it is temperature controlled. But that could be the next evolution in this whole process, yeah, you know. who knows? Um, <laughs> Madeira, Pino Noir Madeira, I don't know about that. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so you get, you get it back to the winery. Get it back the to oak. the winery, um, you know, after, after, for the Pino Noir specifically, um, after it's gone dry, then we rack it off to barrel. Um, French oak, usually uh, a medium toast oak barrel is what we tend to tend to use. Um, roughly 30% new or yeah. so. Um, depends on the vintage, it varies a little bit. Um, but usually 12 to 14 months in barrel, um, okay. and then and then bottling and we're ready to roll. Is it 
pretty typical for the Chardonnay too, like about 30-ish, 40% on the new side on barrel. Yeah, I would say yeah. that's probably, it, it varies again by vintage. Right, um, yeah. It's mostly all barrel ferment um, okay. for, for the, the in-vineyard native yeast portion of it. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that's probably about fair. Yeah, so um, if you're not familiar with that, Burgundy tends to do something very similar. Like they'll use oak in Burgundy, but they don't necessarily use 100% new oak there. Maybe a Grand Cru, maybe a Premier Cru. It's kind of why they're kind of why they're expensive. But like you know, when I went to visit Jadot, like every whether it's like their basic just Chardonnay Pinot, Burgundy, or it's Grand Cru, they use the same barrel program regardless of you know new versus old or New versus first, second, third use oak. Um, maybe, well, they're a big negotiant. They they can spread that they can spread that money out. They can put brand new oak, like twenty or thirty percent new oak, on their fifteen dollar retail chardonnay. They can do that. Same, same thing with Kendall Jackson. That's why Kendall Jackson actually puts oak on their wine because they have they have the ability to do it. I would be able to put make a fifteen dollar bottle of wine with thirty or forty or fifty percent brand new oak. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, no, I think that was really cool. Um, because the, again, so this this Pinot Noir is in that Burgundian-ish style. It's a cooler climate. Um, we're not in that stereotypical Pinot Noir that I really don't like. This is definitely better um, for my palate. What I would like also, it, we've already got five years of age on this. This is a 17, yeah. yeah? So you, you are getting those secondary and tertiary uh, aromas and flavors on it. Um, when we first had it, I didn't know it was a 17. And I remember tasting it, was like, it feels like it's a little bit older. Um, but I, I just assumed it was like a 19 or, or 20. Um, and then we said, well, it's a 17. I was like, ah, oh, that explains everything now. So um, I think it, I think the aromas are great. Um, you've, you've, got, you've got the requisite red, red fruit on there. You've got that cherry, um, but you've also got that earthiness and it really comes through with, with that earth uh, component. It's not like over the top. Like I, like I know there's oak on it, but it's not like I smell and go, oh yeah, there's like a ton of new oak. Like it's not slathered with, with with that vanilla and clove. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 there, but it's it's more of a, an accompaniment rather than like uh, the the main the main thing on there. And then when you put on the palate, really that savoriness, that secondaries, they're really coming through. Um, you know, this is a wine that, you know, already has five years of age on it. It can probably age for longer. Um, you know, I think it's in a great spot. I can see now that we're in better light, I can totally see the color yep. better. And then you can see the age. Oh, no, you can't. But I can see the age on it. It's already got that. It's already starting to get that that normal aging process for a red wine. And when you poured it, I was like, oh, yeah, now I can see it. Whereas before, it was a little bit darker where we were at. But, I noticed it actually as I poured. I was like, "Oh, this looks like it's a little bit different than when we had." Yeah, it right. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got you've got that little more closer to orange color to it, um, which is totally fine. And I think I think it's a wonderful Pinot Noir. Um, luckily, luckily we're two for two on styles here for me. Um, I hey, I already tasted them all. I already know they're all good. So, um, but yeah, uh, I think I think you know Casey, you're doing a great job. Um, I hope to meet you someday now, so I can oh. apologize. Person, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. I think I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, what is this uh, retail? It, th this is going to be closer to something. You, this is not a, this is not a DT uh, direct to consumer, not a DTC type of thing. This is more out uh, under the market. Correct. Yeah. So we the the only as a company, the only tasting rooms we have are our Shide Vineyards label. So Metz Road doesn't have a tasting room that you can okay. visit, at least not today. Who knows? Maybe future state there could right. be. Um, but, but, another, but another ship container next to it. And I mean, <laughs> we could put hey, a whole little <laughs> Lego complex. Of oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, this is going to be mostly in uh, a lot of on-premise, um, a lot of restaurants accounts. Um, you can find it in various uh, retail stores, depending on the market that you live in. Yeah. Um, but it's not a huge production wine. Okay. So um, we're doing about 2,500 cases of the Pinot Noir. It's nothing. No, it's pretty small production. That's nothing. All right, so take that times 12, that's how many bottles. So, I mean, 2,500. So like 24, 20, less than 30,000 bottles around 30. That's not a lot. Trust me, it's not. I think you're trying to supply the whole country. 
that. Yeah, it's, it's not a huge production. <laughs> no. Um, so retail-ish. Uh, we we're about here? thirty-four ninety-nine retail. Okay. Um, you maybe find it twenty-nine ninety-nine uh, on, yeah. on a sale or something Somebody like that. Sale, yeah, yeah. Um, I think you know. I think it's great for that twenty to twenty. I'm sorry, thirty to forty dollar range. I think it's appropriately priced. Um, I think it definitely delivers what you should expect from the area. Uh, I really enjoy it. Um, you know, it, it's. We discussed at the table my preferences for Pinot Noir are not California, but if I'm going to drink California, Monterey, and then I already mentioned the, those cool climate areas are what I prefer in the California side of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And this checks all the boxes for me that I think this would be something I could totally purchase for myself and drink and enjoy. Yeah. So absolutely. I think, I think it's, a, I think it's really well made. Um, I really like the, the native fermentation. That was, that was new. We didn't talk about that, but yeah. I, I like that. That's kind of cool. It's pretty cool. And, and again, it, it's really yeah. the whole idea is to, to really accentuate the sense of place for us, which is our Riverview Vineyard. And it's, I mean, it's a great vineyard. It literally overlooks the Salinas River. So you're kind of up on this bench land overlooking the Salinas River. You've got Pinnacles National Park right behind you directly across the, the valley from us. So we're on the west side of the valley on the east side. Nope, I said that backwards. We're on the east side of the right, yeah. valley. Uh, on the west side of the valley um, is the San Lucia Highlands, which a lot of yes. folks are familiar with and mm -hmm. as a larger sub-AVA of Monterey AVA. Um, so we're on the same parallel as them. Um, the difference being we, uh, the sun is coming up behind us. So they're getting the morning sun. Right. The sun is setting. We're getting the evening sun. Um, that's the biggest difference. Uh, and, and really, my understanding of that was... Um, not so much driven by vineyards, but is driven by where row crops had been planted previously. Um, so the Salinas Valley is a huge agriculture area. We kind of call it the salad bowl of the United States because, I mean, all the row crops you can imagine thrive in the Salinas Valley. Um, so most of the vineyards are up on the foothills uh, these days, and most of the row crops are down on the valley okay. floor. Um, so sense. we're kind of up on the foothills, literally looking down on road crops that are surrounded by surrounding the Salinas River. Yeah, and there literally is Metz Road there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's literally Metz Road. That's right the, that's where the name comes <laughs> yeah, from. It's, from not, it's not some made up name. <laughs> Metz Road is there. All right, so let's um, let's get to the 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 uh, the last one. This was a really cool one. I like this one. Here, I'll make it easier to pour for you. So VDR is a, a quite simple acronym for Very Dark Red. Um, that's the name of the wine. And really, the goal of this wine is, or was, and, and continues to be, to just create a, a very um, big, kind of over-the-top, crowd-pleaser um, wine that really, as we were talking about at lunch, really appeals to people's hedonistic desires. So you want something big and robust and voluptuous. And this has, you know, just a touch of uh, residual sugar that is pleasing and inviting yes. um, on the palate. So that's kind of what we we set out to do with creating this brand um, is a big over the top people pleaser. Um, we didn't really focus so much on how is this going to score when we get to the scoring press and publications? And, you know, are we going to go out and get really high scores? That wasn't the purpose of this wine. The purpose of this wine was a fun people pleaser. Um, fortunately, we ended up with both because this has been getting great scores. Actually, first vintage out of the gate when when we came out with this um, this label and this new package with a, a reimagined and recrafted wine, um, we got 98 points right out of the gate, uh, and we've continued to get great scores. So, it's it's really uh, an interesting wine. It's a wine that can go with your main course, but it is also a wine that can transition into your dessert course, or it's perfectly fine on its own. Absolutely, I talked about how um, as I'm as I'm changing cameras here. Um, <laughs> I'm not, so I don't edit the stuff on the fly. I'm really just making sure all the cameras are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and I hadn't checked them in a minute. Um, but yeah, like we talked about this at, at, at lunch, that this wine totally can be um, something you just drink on its own. Um, and we, we, we touched upon the, the residual sugar, the RS. This is not over the top. Um, this is just, it just at a great spot where, and it's truly residual. Like it's not, nothing, nothing got, nothing funny happened, okay? This is like, this is what it is. It's not a ton. It's really not, trust me. Um, 
but it, it adds it adds some drinkability to it. Um, you have uh, so you have like a lot of different grapes in here. We do. So yeah, let's talk about the, the main grapes. The main grapes. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a blend of quite a lot of grapes. Yeah. Um, the highlights really are Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. Those are the highlights. We've got probably eight to ten other varietals in there depending on the vintage, um, just kind of as a spice rack, if you will. Right. But the bulk of it is really Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Cab, and Merlot. Cool. Now, real quick, um, just because this is not connecting for me, and I'm just going to make sure everything's working right, I'm going to check the main camera real quick, so I'm going to unplug this. So I have this kind of paranoia when it comes to doing <laughs> these camera things uh and sometimes uh things don't operate the way i think they're going to operate and then they end up working fine so um anyway so not to distract from that and i may have cut that part out um so yeah so you've got um i'm pointing at the quad oh. so you've had <laughs> him so like the grapes you have in there even like the petite syrah you know the very dark red that's like a great way to get great color Absolutely. for for the wine and it's also juicy it also adds really ripeness to it it's not necessarily the residual sugar necessarily but it, it it has the ripeness to it and this stuff i mean it tastes really good like i'm a crowd pleaser and hedonistic you you, you guys talk about it being hedonistic and when i tasted it i was like it totally is i can totally drink this by itself and that i love red wine like that because sometimes i just like to drink wine uh white wines are always easier to drink on their own but sometimes I just want something red. I want something juicy with lots of really great dark red fruit and dark black fruit in here. Mm -hmm. You got like a compote on it. Um, you've got that kind of, I would say like that really rich and deep like raspberry or blackberry pie. So you've got that vanilla thing going on. It, it's, it tastes really good. And crowd pleaser is a great way to put it. Now, sometimes I use crowd pleaser as like my 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 um, code for saying that the wine isn't that good. But in this case, I think it really is good. I mean, this is something I would personally buy and enjoy and drink on its own, um, or pair it with like lots of different foods. Mm -hmm. Like I would go on the richer food style. So you could totally do this with like you know pot roast. Um, uh, barbecue, especially barbecue. I think barbecue would be really good, uh, especially smoked meats. Even though it doesn't like a smoky quality, it kind of has that like kind of complimentary thing. Um, you can even do it like a, you could even do this as a Zinfandel substitute for um, uh, like a Thanksgiving thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, so you've got like the cranberry sauce and all that and the turkey and all that. I think you can totally do that. And Thanksgiving's coming up. It's not going to be my Thanksgiving wine. I already got those picked. Um, <laughs> got to record that episode actually pretty soon. Um, but um, it, could be, it could be a Zinfandel substitute. This kind of really reminded me of Zin, especially like the Halloween episode that I did, the three Zins. Um, two of them are much closer to this and stuff. The third one was kind of, we'll talk off camera about that one. But that was kind of cool, though. Um, I really like that, 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 that other Zin. But this is, I, no, I think this is really tasty. Um, and it's... I think it, it, again, checks all the boxes for what it is. And that's the thing. It's like, is this some, like, super serious Cabernet Sauvignon? No, it doesn't need to be. Wine doesn't, wine doesn't need to be super serious. Sometimes wine just needs to be fun. Absolutely. And that's what this is. This is a fun wine. Not that I couldn't have fun with the Sauvignon Blanc or the Pinot Noir. I totally can have fun with those. Um, but this is definitely something I think uh, that, you know, does really well. Hey, he came back. Um <laughs> yeah uh there we go see got it on there um you can't see it <laughs> anyway um what's what's uh retailish retail value on this uh retails for right around twenty dollars twenty dollars yeah. yeah i think it's a great retail for it yeah I mean, you told me 40 i'd be like okay well you know but 20 i think is i, I think we already discussed it was already 20 um but yeah i think it's a great 20 dollar wine I and mean, you could go a little bit higher i mean find it for 25 somebody sell it for 30 okay but it might be on sale for like 18 somewhere, 17. Somebody might put it on a, on, a, on a sale. But I think for 20 bucks, I think you're, you've got a really good wine that can appeal to a lot of different people. Um, and I think you know, we're getting into holidays, and this is a great time for having that crowd pleaser wine. If you're having a holiday party, you're having um, something like whether it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, um, we're already past Halloween. But like this would have been a good Halloween wine. <laughs> it would have. You know, so... 
I think that that's something to think about when you're buying wine. What are you buying it for? If you're buying it for yourself to have at home with certain foods, you can, you know, this, this wine can do that. But if you're looking for something that's more of a, a, a wine that you're going to have the people over, you want to have a party or whatever, um, this is totally, totally good for that. I like it. Yeah, or if you're going to a party and you want to bring mm. a housewarming gift. Exactly. Uh, you know, I think this is a great want to bring something? Yeah. Um, I think the quality is there. Um, I think we're at a good spot. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to chat about? You know? Besides, I know that we have something to do after this. <laughs> oh, we do have, we have another thing to go to. We got, but we got, the one thing that we Yeah, let's brought, talk about these guys. Yeah, quick. so these are, we touched on them briefly at the beginning, but I think they're and worth I'll try mentioning. these later, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I think that they're worth mentioning again. So um, Sunny with a Chance of Flowers is a, a really unique brand uh, for us. It fits into the better for you, healthy lifestyle category. Um, so it's a lower alcohol wine. It's only about 9% alcohol, um, re reduced sugar, actually zero sugar. Um, and therefore, mostly, as we spoke about, is mostly the alcohol that's reducing the calories less so the sugar that's reducing the calories, but it is zero sugar um, and lower calories. So your typical glass of wine is about 140 calories a glass. Um, this one's only about 85 calories a glass. So, yeah. you know, it, it really fits. It was um, a wine that we introduced just about at the start of COVID, um, which for us ended up being uh, very serendipitous that the timing just fit because at that time people were staying at home they were tr really trying to focus on being healthier and that's a trend that you know existed before but i think was really magnified um because of of covid and it has continued through so we've lots of consumers that are just really attaching um and and enjoying this brand uh because it allows them to have an extra glass um, and maybe they don't feel as guilty and, uh, they can, you know, get up and feel great the next morning rather than being a little bit fuzzy. Um, so really, really great wine. What we do that's a little bit different than most, uh, with Sunny with a Chance of Flowers is we actually let the grapes, I guess the way you get to a lower alcohol wine, there's multiple ways to do this. Yes. Uh, so the way we do it is we actually let the grapes get to full maturity, full ripeness. And then we have a proprietary kind of two filter process that strips out some of the alcohol, um, leaves, you know, about 9% is what's left in, in the bottle. But that re proprietary process reduces the alcohol, um, but it still keeps the wine varietally correct. Uh, it still has all of the flavors and characteristics. So um, this is the, the rosé offering, but we also do a Sauvignon Blanc, a Cabernet, a Pinot Noir. They're all very true to varietal. Um, when you taste the Chardonnay and you, when you smell the Chardonnay, you're, that's a Chardonnay. Um, yeah. And that's what's unique about ours is our process, um, letting the full ripeness of the full maturity of the grape um, to be achieved, and then doing a very slow and gradual process of removing the alcohol out. Um, a lot of it gets way above my head. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> we would need someone like Casey here to, to right, help describe yeah. it to us. Um, but my understanding of it is uh, the process that we're using, very slow and gradual and, and gentle processing by uh, in, in the way that we're removing the alcohol, really preserves a lot of the fruit flavors that, that we want to stay in the glass because that's the important thing. So I'm glad I have somebody here with one of these healthier for you wines because before we talk, we, so we talked about it, he goes, you want to do this? Like, well, you know, I have a very critical view of this category, but the fact that we were honest about how we get the lower alcohol, I'm like totally cool with because it was fully fermented, right? That's why it is dry. That's why it is the zero sugar or, you know, whatever, the really low residual sugar, right? Um, it's, it has to be below a certain point. I mean, there's probably a couple of grams per like a couple of grams, not even, it's probably like what a gram or a half a gram per liter or something like that. It's, it's going to have, a, there's a, there's a certain level, but basically it's fully fermented, right? So, but the idea is that you have all the flavors, you have everything like it's a regular wine and being transparent about like you're, you're reducing the alcohol rather than you're picking super early. And then you have the kind of like really kind of unbalanced, super acidic, like it doesn't taste right. Um, yeah, you got low alcohol out of it, but usually your low alcohol wines, like a nine percenter, is going to be higher in sugar. 
um, because they didn't fully ferment it. And that's like intention, like Riesling is, is the most common example is like they didn't fully ferment everything, even though, and they probably picked a little early too, but in order to get that 9% like fully fermented, you got to pick super early and it's not going to be phenolically right. So it's not going to come out right. So the fact that you're doing it that way and you're giving us a wine like that, I'm really excited to try this later on. And the only reason we're not trying these other wines is because just time. We didn't want to spend too much time on the wines and we these are the wines we tried at, at lunch and I wanted to focus on what we tried so I, so I could do that. But I'm glad we brought that up. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited to try this, and I think um, if you see it out there, you should give it a try too. Uh, maybe I'll put a little comment that I tried it and I liked it. Hopefully that's why I'm sure I liked it. Um, I love rosé, by the way. So then this one would have been great if I had known about it like three weeks ago when I bought my Halloween wines, but Stokes Ghost. I want to know more about this. Petite Sirah. Oh, petite Sirah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Stokes Ghost is a is a fun brand of ours. Um, this one, the the whole story, um, there is a ghost, and it, James Stokes uh, Ghosts haunts a building in Monterey. Um, it's Stokes Adobe, and that's actually his home, or was his home. He was a, a sailor that a British sailor that um, came to Monterey, basically jumped ship, um, stole all the pharmaceutical supplies off of the ship and opened up his own practice in, in Monterey and went on to have many clients and he was kind of experimenting and you know some of it worked out okay. Uh, a lot of other people lost their lives, um, <laughs> including the, the governor <laughs> of the state of California. Okay. So <laughs> un under his uh, supervision, if you will. There's a reason why we have the FDA. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we decided uh, you know, to, to come out with a brand that just sort of told this story. Um, it is, it's a petite Syrah. Um, it's grown at uh, our southern Monterey County vineyards. Um, so big, bold, very, you know, robust petite Syrah like it should be, um, but approachable and, and easy drinking as well. It's not the kind that strips the enamel off of your teeth. Um, but very fun wine, very fun story. Um, and we actually had our uh, a national sales and marketing meeting back in Monterey of four or five months ago. And we had actually got to have a dinner at the Stokes restaurant, oh, that's cool. uh, Stokes Adobe restaurant. And uh, we enjoyed some of the Stokes wine. So nice, really fun. I'm, I'm excited to try that. I do. I mean, it was a cool story. That's why we put it on here. Um, I'm excited to try this a little bit later on. I'll give you my thoughts on it. I mean, I'll put it, I'll put a lower third saying that I probably liked it. So, I mean, I like Petit Sirah on its own. It's, it's really cool because sometimes you, I've already mentioned this is used as that color, um, color flavor stuff, but on its own, it can be really cool stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to try that. Um, yeah, I think, I think we've, um, hit our time limit. We're at 55 minutes. -ish. Pretty darn good. So what yeah. We're shooting for. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, all right, folks. So that's going to wrap it up as always. Uh, make sure you, you click like and subscribe to all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. And, um, I'm out of wine. Let's, let's toast real oh. quick here. Uh, this is because it's the closest thing to me. <laughs> Just a splash. Yeah, I wasn't talking to you, Siri. <laughs> oh, you got it. You, you've always got to take the spotlight away. Anyway, thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. And we'll see everyone again next time.